Hello everyone and welcome to episode 3 of Historical Oddities. Today we're going to be talking about weapon design again, but this time we're looking at design philosophies and how two countries went about designing weapons that would serve a similar purpose but would have major differences in the overall design. With that idea, today we're looking at the Heavy Gustav railway gun and the Little David heavy mortar. For the former, in the mid-1930s, the German military sought an artillery piece strong enough to destroy de French defensive positions along the Maginot Line. The gun would need to be strong enough to pierce 7 meters of concrete, or 1 meter of steel. Krupp Manufacturing was tasked with designing such a weapon and determined that to achieve the strength required to do that, the caliber of the round it fired would have to be about 80 centimeters. It was also determined that the size and weight of a weapon firing such a caliber would be so large that it would not function as a standard railway gun and would require two sets of parallel tracks to evenly distribute the weight. Even though the gun was originally intended to be used in the invasion of France, production issues ensured that would never happen. The first of these massive guns began production in early 1937 and eventually saw combat against the Soviet Union in June 1942 during the Siege of Sevastopol. Because of the gun's size, weight, and complexity, actually setting up and using the gun was a complete nightmare. First off, it took about 25 train cars just to transport the thing where it was needed to be. Second, in addition to needing two sets of parallel tracks to sit on, it needed sets of track in a semicircle to rotate itself, as the gun could not move the barrel horizontally, only vertically. Third, it took a team of several thousand soldiers several days to several weeks to actually set the gun and the tracks up. Fourth, it took a team of around 500 soldiers to actually use the gun. Fifth, the gun could only fire about 15 rounds a day due to the calibration needed on each shot. And sixth, it was highly vulnerable to aircraft attacks and needed personal anti-aircraft stations to defend its position. While the gun was certainly powerful and managed to destroy an ammo site at White Cliff that was 30 meters underwater and protected by an additional 10 meters of concrete, it achieved little other success. It is reported to have damaged the Maxim Gorky 1 coastal battery as well, but it suffered from overall accuracy issues and just 10 of the 47 or 48 rounds it fired landed within 60 meters of their target. After Sevastopol, it was intended to be used later at the Siege of Leningrad, but its use there was cancelled. This gun would never see active use ever again, and was later destroyed in 1945 by the Germans before the Allies could capture it. It is also reported that a second one was built, but there is conflicting information as to whether it was actually made, or if other sources just mistake the first one for a second one. But anyway, while the Germans made this massive, complex, technologically impressive, but wholly impractical gun, the Americans made a massive gun of their own, this one firing an even larger 91.4 centimeter round. However, unlike the Germans, the American one was quite a bit simpler. Instead of making this massive and complex machine, the Americans basically made a big old steel tube. The initial intent behind the Little David heavy mortar was to use it to breach the Siegfried line along western Germany. However, after the line was breached without it, it was planned to be used during the invasion of Japan. However, Japan surrendered while the gun was still in the trial phase, so it would never actually see combat. Even though it was never used, it is still debatable that it would have been a more practical weapon than the Gustav cannon was. Even though its firing range of 6 miles was almost one-fifth of the Gustav's range of 29 miles, it was much more practical to deploy and be ready to fire. While the Gustav took several days to several weeks to be ready to fire and 25 rail cars to move, the Little David could be ready to fire in just about 12 hours and moved on just two M25 transport vehicles. A bulldozer and crane with a bucket were also to be transported with it to aid in the deployment of it. Even though the Little David was technologically inferior, I do believe that because it could be set up in a fraction of the time made it much more viable of a weapon, even though the 12 hour setup time for a 6 mile range isn't exactly fantastic. 
However, I think the comparison of these two weapons underlines the overall difference in design philosophies between Germany and the United States in World War II. A more famous example of this is in the tanks each country used. German tanks are very well renowned for being these sort of technological marvels, very strong and beautifully made, but they also frequently suffered from breakdowns and mechanical issues due to their complexity. On the other hand, American tanks were rather simple to make and could be produced on automobile production lines. While they weren't nearly as powerful as German tanks, the fact that they could be made easily and quickly gave the Americans the advantage of being able to easily replace lost tanks. So overall, a lot of German weapon design was often based on power, complexity, and how impressive the gun was, while American design was simply based off of practicality and how simple it was to use. The German philosophy is much better for a small, well-stocked military, but when you need to mobilize an entire nation, the American philosophy is generally the way to go. Alrighty, and that should do it for this video. I wanted a different video to be out here at this point, but some unforeseen circumstances meant that video won't be out for a little while, so I did this one instead. Of course, do remember to like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, and watch the other two videos in this little series. One's about a different gun, and one's about a metal. You should check them out. Anyway, I hope to see you in the next video, and I hope you learned something. Later.